And I, I think really that dyslexia or many difficulties are a problem for everyone to have some solution to assist with. And, and again, if it up to me in, in higher education, I, I would be interested in those individuals who receive training in dyslexia and other things, if they're working on a, in, a doctor, a master's, an EDS, or a bachelor's degree, everyone needs to know this stuff. And once you get to the point where everyone knows this information, then you know, we're going to have an easier time solving some of these, these issues with the kids. So number one is providing accommodations. And when we write accommodations, and I'll talk about some specifically, the one that I'm really interested in is individuals taking a little bit longer time. Because even when they become competent readers, that probably entails them still being relatively slow readers. And I have a friend in Arkansas who started off as a physical therapist, but because her son had dyslexia and there was no one around who could help her son, she started learning everything that she could and she had specialized training. And now she's a specialist in dyslexia, helped co-write the first law in 2013 um, that dealt with dyslexia, and she's now the dyslexia resource person at, at the high school that she's employed in. And a lot of her, uh, and she has all the kids with dyslexia in high school, that's, that's her responsibility. And a lot of them were getting C's and D's in their courses, and she found out that they just couldn't finish the test, you know, that they knew the stuff, but didn't have the ability to show what they knew, so she went to the content teachers and said, look, they can, you know, what, what's going to happen if we give them a longer period of time to read because they have reading difficulties and probably to score better on the test and show us what they really know. And so they can come to my home room and whatever you suggest for the test, like no book, you know, no open book, no open notes, whatever you want, that's what I'll do, but I'll just give them time and a half. And so for a 30 minute exam, they got 45 minutes. For an hour exam, they got an hour and a half. And those kids were getting C's and D's because the reading difficulties went to A's and B's. Nothing else. They just had longer time to show what they knew. And this is one of the things I tell parents when parents say, I don't really want my kid to have a diagnosis of dyslexia because I don't want them to have a label. And I tell them, yes, you do want them to have a label. And the reason why that's important is because when they go to take the ACT or the SAT and they struggle with reading but they know a lot of stuff, ETS is now allowing students to have more time as an accommodation to take a test, which means they're going to score better. And if you wait until like, you say, well, I don't want that label, but when they're a junior, we'll go ahead and do it, then it looks kind of suspicious. Like, oh, now you've got this one, right? So you, know, you really have to have that uh, maintained for some time before they're going to really uh, allow you to do those accommodations. And that's, I think that's important because certainly the better you score in those tests, the, light, the higher the likelihood you're going to get into school of your choice, plus get scholarships and other things. So it's not a trivial, trivial matter. Read the Oklahoma Dyslexia Handbook. Actually, I've read it. It's really good. I like how it's presented because it, each chapter starts off with a myth and then debunk, debunks the myth, and then goes on to explain more aspects about it. So if you haven't read the, Dyslux, uh, the Oklahoma Dyslexia Handbook, I would highly recommend that you do so, because there's a lot of really good information in there. They've spent some pretty uh, good amount of time you know, developing that. And then, of course, use your newly acquired knowledge in the science of reading to evaluate uh, identification, evaluation instruments, and intervention approaches. And at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I have my email address, and I really do like to communicate with you, answer your questions, and every place, that, this is our fifth location in the state, uh, seven days, five different locations, and uh, I actually respond to everyone who sends me an email message. And if I don't, um, Send it again because my inbox gets overloaded and sometimes I miss it, but I do want to answer your questions because I think that's an important aspect of what we're doing. We're giving you a, kind of a taste of what things are like, uh, but you're going to have questions and I would like to be able to answer them. And it, in fact, in this, in this part of the day, if you want to blur out a question, you know, please do so because 
a lot of times what happens, you're like, well, I'll ask him again, and you either don't write down and forget, or you're like, you know what, I, I really do want to know the answer, but I really want to get out of here more. <laughs> so uh, I really don't mind if you blur them out. Yes? Some people uh, say there's a difference. You know, if we ask, I don't, I don't know if there's any, been any research to actually look at that specifically. Um, a child's preference might be one or the other, but you know, some of the research that has been done, and if you didn't hear the question was, on the state testing, is there a difference between doing it online versus paper and pencil? I don't think there's a really good answer to that necessarily at this point in time. Um, but we know that individuals who have looked at electronic devices versus books in terms of college have found that individuals who read textbooks actually perform better on tests uh, when it's the same content, same course, everything that someone who's reading it on a device. Uh, which is really interesting, actually. They actually learn better from using a book they can hold in their hand and turn the pages. I'm really not sure why that is, but that, that's some evidence we know for sure is the case. Yes. So I just attended a letters training earlier this week, and they actually said that there is some research that shows that you retain more when you read from paper than you do when you read from computer. Yeah. Uh, and specifically with dyslexia, do you think? Or they no, they just said in general. Yeah. Yeah, in general, that's the case. Um, so if, if we're going to extrapolate, you know, my guess would be probably would be you know, a bit better if it was a paper version than electronic, but. I really don't know that, you know, with this you know, generation, but generally speaking, you know, that's the case. Um, which is a good question. And then letters. Uh, letters is, is created by Louisa Motes, and so here's the link to her aspect of Louisa Motes. Louisa Motes uh, was really a classroom teacher first, and then she was wondering why people were not doing well in reading, and then got a doctorate, and, sort of working those things, and what she does right now is an awful lot of uh, in-service training because we know that you know individuals aren't taught pre-service, so she's out there, letters is really uh, a good program. Yes? You said earlier that the discrepancy model is not appropriate to use for a how they qualify special education. Correct. That's what our school uses. What are we supposed to be using? I'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> question was, uh, in case you didn't hear, which I'll just repeat the questions every time, so I won't explain why there's two videos, because I know you can't hear, but uh, the question was, um, I forgot what we asked. Yeah. <laughs> so still oh yeah, the discrepancy model. Right. Yeah, we're going to talk about why the discrepancy is, model is not appropriate and what you should be doing uh, rather than the discrepancy model. So uh, yeah, well, thank you. That's, that's a good question. So here's some accommodations, just in general, for all individuals who have dyslexia, uh, no matter what grade they are in, or what the issue might be, these are all things that can be helpful. Uh, firstly, you know, a lot more time on exams and assignments. Certainly, uh, it's going to be very, very helpful to these individuals, because remember, even if they are becoming competent readers, they're becoming competent readers, and they're going to be they're going to be slower in terms of reading and it's going to take more time. Because even individuals who have dyslexia who are, are competent readers in transparent writing systems, they're still going to be slower in reading. So our guys are met with more challenge than that. So slow reading is definitely going to be an issue. And I usually recommend, when I do accommodation letters, I, I recommend 1.5 to 2 times the amount of time. Twice in some cases if they have severe dyslexia, one and a half if they don't. Uh, but anywhere between that. Uh, any less than that's probably going to be a little more challenging. Any tests or exams or quizzes that are done, uh, we, if, firstly I should say this, we should ask the individual what they want. I, I think the, the extra time thing is just blanket for everyone. Uh, because it's going to just take up more time. But I had a student who was in college and came to my office as my mom, and my girlfriend said, you know something about dyslexia, so I should come and talk to you. So I had a conversation with him about dyslexia, et cetera, and, <coughs> dyslexia. 
The next time he came, he said, okay, now my mom and my girlfriend and you guys should get accommodations. And I said, what do they think you need? And it was like 12 different things. And I said, what do you think you need? And he only had a list of two things. Uh, so, you know, we need, we need to ask the individual, or of course the IEP meeting or the Final Four team or the student improvement team or whatever the may, case may be, involving the individual to input what they really uh, would need. That's, I think, uh, relatively essential. Uh, but a quiet room is important because an individual who has dyslexia but doesn't have say, ADHD or anything like that, they're still struggling to use a lot of those cognitive resources to learn and to think. And anything that's out there that can compete with that attention is going to just make it that much more challenging for them. So if there's an opportunity for them to be in a quiet room, potentially by themselves when they're doing the test, uh, that's, that can be helpful. Now, if they have dyslexia and ADHD on top of that, then clearly they need to be away from distractions. And what we find is when you're away from distractions, they perform better. And you, you can argue, well, what about their work environment? Are they going to be in a work environment? You know, should we prepare them for that? You know, let's get them through school first. You know? And then we can do some of those other things. And even in work environments, you know, they provide opportunities for accommodations if we're headphones and all kinds of stuff that cancels out noise and helps them. So in school, these are things we can do. United is great for spelling. Uh, particularly on papers, because and even though you can say, well, don't, can't they at least, you know, use some technology to help them <coughs> with spelling and autocorrect and those kinds of things, but sometimes you have to really know what the word is before the, the technology can figure out what you're trying to spell, and sometimes that's not the case here. Uh, the other part seems to read out loud in class, that is the pits, the absolute pits for kids. Um, because imagine, you know, as I said earlier, we get to work with our strengths and we can ignore our weaknesses. Imagine that whatever your weakness is, not only are your, your, the people at home concerned about your weakness and always talk about your weakness and you can never escape from it, and then you go to work and everybody knows your weaknesses and always harping you about your weaknesses, and eventually you're like, I'm really just tired of life. I'm just tired of it. And that's where these kids are. Because most kids can, you know, it, ignore their weakness because nobody really cares about their weakness. But kids who have reading problems, as soon as they walk into the school, it's like a beacon of light comes on and follows them wherever they go and outs them for their weakness. That's hard. That's really hard. And so if you're required to read out loud in class, and you're always, a, you know, already kind of concerned about that and conscious of the fact that they don't read very well, and then if someone snickers or you know, one of them up here earlier said, you know, make fun of me, you know, don't need that. We don't need to out them on our weaknesses because all of us have weaknesses. And no one outs us on our weaknesses. And no one really cares about our weaknesses either. But in school, everybody's got to read. And if we're making them read out loud in class, then, you know, there's, everyone's going to know uh, or it's going to be in their face or they know. And, you know, there, are, there are times when, again, you got to ask because I know one child had a uh, fairly severe case of dyslexia. He said, I want to read out loud in class. Really? That's amazing. But he wanted to, so then he should. Because uh, he said it didn't help him. But I've also had kids, there's a kid from southern Arkansas that came to our center for one of our week long intensive interventions. And we started up Monday at 9 in the morning and we worked till. 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, five days. It's really super intense. And uh, I was having a conversation with him, and he said, he told me his teacher never knew he had dyslexia. I'm like, come on, you know, that can't really be true. And I said, how can that be? He said, well, whenever I read in class, I just read really quickly and mumbled, because he couldn't read. And the teacher just let him go. Well, okay, I mean, he figured out a strategy to get around that, but. <coughs> I uh, thought maybe at some point she'd say, I wonder if he's actually reading anything, <laughs> but not the case. And <clears throat> you do not require kids to go to the blackboard or the whiteboard to spell, because spelling is just horrendous for them. Uh, and again, if they want to, that's fine, but most kids who have dyslexia and reading difficulties don't want to, because there's no way they're going to spell that word correctly. It's just not really likely to happen. 
And I guess I can tell you this too, that, um, at this point, but one of the things we found in terms of science is that homework for elementary grade students does not improve their academic skills or achievement at all, at all. Uh, so the question is, should we be doing homework for those kids? Probably not, probably not. And the reason why I tell you this is because any parent who has a child with dyslexia, where you've got 20 minutes, you're supposed to be doing this homework, they're spending two or three hours on it. And if there's someone that's lasting half an hour, they're spending four hours. And the level of stress and anxiety in that family because of that is horrendous. For what purpose? No purpose. It's not going to happen. The achievement levels in elementary grade isn't affected by homework. A lot of schools, but besides the United States, don't do homework. You know? Uh, in other countries, they don't even do homework. Uh, in middle school and high school, there is some evidence that uh, homework can be effective in terms of increasing the achievement levels. But elementary level, uh, really, particularly for families that have a child with dyslexia, it is you know, ask, ask their parents, you know, oh, your child is dyslexic, how much time do you spend on homework? Yeah. And see, the problem with that, if they're spending three or four hours on homework, there's three or four hours they're not spending on things that are actually important for the development like team sports and music and all that kind of stuff that's helpful to them, they don't get to do that. And that's, I think, clearly wrong. I mean, Nietzsche said, without music, life would be a mistake. Uh, I don't think we can actually extract music from humans. It's not possible. But obviously, those things are important. <coughs> Remove extraneous materials from worksheets. Um, guilty of this too, because I, I am a teacher. And we like to over-explain. If my kids hated asking me sometimes a question that was one they wanted to know the answers to, because they wanted a yes or no answer, but I spent 20 minutes explaining it to them, right? Because that's what we are, we're teachers. I want them to know every reason why we're saying yes or no, right? Um, and that, that certainly can be a problem. So we over-explain worksheets. And so with kids who have dyslexia, the minimal amount of relevant information, how to perform, is all they need. Like pictures and stuff like that, they get distracted by all that information. We just need to have relevant information and then they'll let them do whatever that worksheet is about. So the less information, the better in that regard. Um, fewer words on tests and assignments, particularly for individuals who have the sex to get to the point. Uh, use assistive, assistive technology, and you got to hear about that at one time. But I'll give you an example. Uh, this individual, bless you, at Emory, and he is working on leukemia. That's his research area. And he's quite gifted. Someday, his work is so avant-garde that he's got the potential to be nominated for Nobel Prize. And he's doing really outstanding work, may help us understand and essentially cure leukemia. He was born a Spanish speaker and learned how to write in Spanish. Spanish is what type of writing system? Transparent. So he learned how to read, no problem. I mean, some problems probably. He has dyslexia. And he, he is now at Emory. He speaks English very fluently. And he can read fairly well in English. But he can't write hardly at all. So he told me that for him to write a memo, it takes him 30 to 45 minutes, because it takes him about 10 to 15 minutes every sentence that he writes. And he's got to reread it, and he's got to change it, because it makes no sense. And then he gives it to someone else to read. They don't know what he's talking about. So he's a very, very poor uh, writer as a function of that's the part of the dyslexia that's not that's a problem for him. So I was speaking to him on the phone for like 45 minutes, and he's worried because to work in a university, you have to write grants to support your reading. And he's got to be able to write grants. Right? He's a problem for him. And he wants to write up the results and submit it for scientific publication, because that's how you get to stay at universities like that. Remember the publish or perish? You know, heard that? You don't publish in scientific journals and you don't get to stay. And he likes the job and everything. And he says, I, I just don't know what to do. I would like to come out to your center to get an evaluation of dyslexia. And I said, okay, we can make that happen. Uh, but I said, in the meantime, you have no problems articulating exactly what's on your mind. So what you need is a speech to text editor that you can say, and it'll write it for you. Then your colleagues, because we all work in research groups, then your colleagues can take that information and work with that, rather than this terse, uh, very complicated, and 
un uh, understanding is, is very minimal in terms of what you're writing. And I haven't heard from them since, so I'm figuring that probably weren't for them. And, you know, uh, Microsoft has, is developing a lot of good stuff for individuals with dyslexia at no cost. Like you can go to dictate.ms and download dictation and you put it in Word and and I think I have some of this maybe at the end of the presentation, which I'm not going to talk about, but I just put it on there for your reference. But you, you upload it into Word and then you click on the microphone and then you just say what you want to write and then it writes it for you. Uh, those are really really important. And for those, you know, we talked about earlier, the kids who have stories to tell but they don't read or write very well, this is a way for them to get their stories out. Yes? Uh, Dictate.ms for Microsoft. Dictate.ms. And there's a, a lot of good stuff for, uh, you know, some other programs that are out there too, they're Microsoft. Uh, and, and they're really good. And it, as it turns out, we found out that they're not just good with, for kids that have dyslexia, but they also can highlight, you can tell them how like the verbs in different colors and adjectives and stuff. Actually, kids who don't have reading problems actually learn quite a bit by using these programs as well. Uh, so I think assistive technology is, is really uh, a, a wonderful thing to have. And then the last one is the easiest one you guys can do because you're already in that mode already. And that's to provide emotional and psychological support. So, you, know, you can say things like, you know, you have a, you have a reading difficulty, if you know you have dyslexia, I know you have dyslexia, and I know you're struggling to be a competent reader, and I know you want to become a good reader, and I don't know everything yet now, but we're going to work on this together. You're okay. You're okay. We'll figure this out. And you wouldn't believe how much help that is for a person. You're like, oh, I'm not fighting this myself. I'm not fighting this against everyone else and my teacher. My teacher's on my side. That's you know, I can handle it now. And that, that's important. Because almost every time we find out there's someone else like us or we can connect with, it makes life a lot easier for us. And as parents, probably the worst thing that we can do is keep stuff like that a secret. Because if you keep it a secret or don't tell people, you don't get information to help you. And then, you know, to become a parent, there's so much stuff you got to know that you just don't know. You know, when you become a parent, you learn as you go, you know, so, you know, having a student that you're saying, hey, it's going to be okay, we're going to work on this together, uh, we'll make this happen, uh, is great. And I told you about the college student that came to me that said he had dyslexia, his mom and his girlfriend uh, <clears throat> wasn't getting to talk to me. After the third time he came, I, I took him down to the center and said, you know what, why don't you consider being an interventionist? And he did, he became an interventionist for us. He was the most popular one because he has dyslexia. He's a college student. He's doing A-OK -okay in college. And here he's working with these kids who now think, I can do that too. You know, so that kind of connection is so important. Or if you as a teacher, because <clears throat> I would suspect there's, you know, some of you in here struggle to become competent leaders, right? No harm in telling the kids that you have reading issues, because then they feel like they're part of something that is a little bigger themselves, they don't have to fight it, fight it on themselves. <clears throat> so I'll make it the same thing, don't require kids to read out loud in class, unless they want to. Not to write on whiteboards or blackboards, unless they want to. <clears throat> and if we're doing spelling tests, let's make the spelling test uh, comprised of decodable words. Now, granted, you're asking what's a decodable word. <clears throat> a decodable word is one that is easily decoded and synthesized so the person can read. Now, for us as adults, essentially, almost all words are decodable, right? But what we mean by decodable is they kind of fit the regular scenario of how we can decode the language of sounds in the blend of irregular words or words that they don't really decode that easily. We have to figure out a different way to pronounce the word based upon its spelling. So we wanted, essentially, what we're trying to do is buttress their strengths in their development of the mechanics of reading. <clears throat> and the mechanics of reading, <coughs> the mechanics of reading are when we're trying to teach them the sounds that go with the letters, 
how to decode those letters into sounds, synthesizing those sounds into words. <clears throat> That's the mechanics of reading. And so if we're doing things to help them along that journey, then that's going to be helpful to them in their acquisition of reading. And so if we have spelling tests comprised of words that they can utilize those skills that are new, they're developing right now, that's going to be helpful. If we have them do spelling tests that aren't like that, it's not going to be helpful. And what we find very frequently with parents is they'll spend a couple of nights, a couple hours each night, working on spelling words. And Monday night is just atrocious. Tuesday night, they know a few of them. Wednesday night, they're getting there. Thursday night, they spell every single word correctly. Yes! <coughs> Friday, they can't spell any of them. And the parents are like, oh my, how many hours did we spend doing this? What, what happened? I don't know, I'm just going to do it. Well, if they're becoming more words, and they're using the mechanics of reading, <coughs> then they're more likely to be able to spell those words rather than memorize them. Because see, some individuals who have dyslexia not only have phonological processing deficiencies, but they also have phonological <coughs> memory issues. So these are kids we can get the letter out saying, what's this? We tell them it's letter and we say it's ah. This is that. Can you say ah? It says ah. We put it behind your back and say, you keep it there for a second or two and say, okay, what's this? And you go, oh, I'm sorry. What is it? Can you tell me again? And they, you say, ah, say ah, and you say ah. Say, okay, got it? Okay. What's it now? Oh, tell me one more time what it is. And you're thinking to yourself, you walk to school. How do you get here? <laughs> well, the answer to that is a different type of memory. Phonological memory is not sticking. Other types of memory, oh yeah, absolutely, they got stuff. Uh, but for us, as individuals who don't understand it, like this, and they, no, are you messing with me? Seriously, I just said, ah. Yeah. Yeah. How do you not know that? Well, the answer is that's just part of the issue. And so, you know, when we, we have a couple of words that have a, uh, at least a chance to do it. Of course, earlier you said, can we use a plastic strip or a piece of paper to help identify the line we're working on? Uh, that's important because, you know, when kids are learning how to read, they put their finger on the word, right? They're decoding words, synthesizing reading, and going back to it. But kids is, with dyslexia, see, those words they're reading now are getting smaller on a piece of paper. And so it's harder for them to track it. So they can track it, helps them kind of not have to worry about where they're looking in addition to trying to read. They're just working on the decoding and reading aspects of it. And then use Bookshare. Um, I think Bookshare is a really tremendous uh, opportunity for kids to learn about the content material without having to get through the reading issue to get there. <coughs> Then individuals who are in secondary or secondary students <coughs> look for different ways for them to show their knowledge. They don't always have to be in an exam format. You know, there's other ways for individuals to show what they know. Uh, and those opportunities are going to help, like oral presentations and things of that nature. Because uh, you're going to find that quite frequently these individuals really know what they're talking about. But if you ask them to do a test, then it becomes a reading test and not a content test. And you think about that for a second. You know, if we're asking them to do something in their weakness, and they never really get the opportunity to show their strength, at some point they just give up. You know, we look at the number of kids who drop out of school because of dyslexia, it's pretty high. In fact, I don't know if you know this name, but Amir Baraka, who was nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award uh, last spring, and he had severe dyslexia. And when he was in school, he just never went to school on Fridays when he was in third and fourth grade. Why? Don't attack. Tired of being humiliated. Like, I can't spell those stupid words anyway. It's not going on Friday. And eventually he dropped out of school. And his dad was a drug dealer, and he became a drug dealer, and he did a whole bunch of really horrible things and ended up where? Prison. Yep. And when he was in prison, he noticed, he knew he didn't know how to read, but he was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of people here who don't know how to read. And no one really knows what the percentage of individuals in prison who can't read, but it's somewhere between, at the very lowest, it's probably 40% up to about 80%. And you know, it probably depends on you know, the prison. But we know a lot of people in prison end up there because they can't read, because they can't read, they drop out of school, what opportunities do you have? I mean, it's just kind of a bad deal. Plus, if you're in prison and you don't know how to read, you get out of prison, you did your time, you get out of prison, what's going to happen to you? Probably coming back. You know, we can, we can cut the recidivism rate in half 
by teaching individuals how to read. There's no, no doubt about those kinds of things. But anyway, Amir Baraka, he had time when he was in prison, he thought, I need to learn how to read. So he learned how to read, sort of. Really not learning how to read, but he memorized the visual consolation of the word, and he had a really good memory. So what he'd do is he'd look at the word, he'd memorize it, he'd look at the dictionary and try and figure out what it meant, and he kind of developed his reading that way. Uh, that is not the way we should be teaching reading. That is absolutely, unequivocally, no doubt, the wrong way to teach reading. But when he got out, he thought, I need to do something about that. And so he developed, with his partner, Leland Hardy, the Dyslexia Awareness Foundation. And they partnered with the Center for Reading, which uh, we have at our university, they partner with us because they're going to find the funding, and what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, upon intake, every field penitentiary, uh, we're going to evaluate individuals for their reading skills, and then we're going to help them become competent readers, hopefully, while they're in prison, so when they get out, they have halfway to try to do something other than what they did to get themselves in there. Uh, so, in reality, I mean, these are things that we can do today to help individuals, and <coughs> You know, one of the ways when we're talking about kids with uh, secondary issues in middle school and high schools, have alternative ways for them to show what they know, which would be very helpful to them. Allow the use of assistive technology, text to speech, speech to text, those types of things. For ADHD, and again, we're talking about ADHD because a lot of individuals who have uh, dyslexia also have issues with ADHD. And people who have ADHD or kind of struggle to learn how to read. Although once they become competent readers, the reading issue is not as much of a problem. So again, more time for exams, quiet room. And then for classroom situations, you want to keep them away from very distracting parts of the classroom. Stay away from the bulletin boards. Stay away from the door to the hallway because there's always stuff going on in the hallway they're going to be looking at. Um, and as a teacher, you don't have to lecture to them, but if you're lecturing around them to the class, it's going to be easier for these individuals to pay attention to what's going on. But in your technology is really great where you're mic'd up like I am right now, and the individual has the receiver in his or her ear, and what that does is then they are hearing the teacher's voice stronger than the rest of the environment, so they're more likely to be able to pay attention. And in some classrooms, they actually have speakers in the ceilings. And as it turns out, when a teacher used a microphone where the, her, his or her voice is being amplified and coming out of speakers in the ceiling, other students like that too. Because uh, there's a lot of noise going on there getting missed up. And then with louder teacher's voice, that's very helpful to them. Uh, so a lot of new technology is available or something like that. So I talk about identification procedures. What is typically used by school psychologists who are out there evaluating individuals who have reading difficulties. And we want to get the school psychologists up to speed on dyslexia so they can help identify kids as early as possible so we can do things to help them become competent readers. So school sites are the individuals in the school system that can really help with this, uh, no doubt about that. But these are the things they typically look at, uh, the lecture intelligence scale for children. Uh, the first intelligence scale was developed to differentiate children who could and who probably weren't going to benefit from education from those who would. And that's why Alfred Binet uh, developed the intelligence test to do that. Wexler came along later and thought, well, intelligence test might give us some insight into how the person's neurological system works. And so rather than just having an overall score like the older Binet did, now the Wexler scale gives you lots of different subtests. It gives you information about all kinds of different processing that tells us a little too more about neurological processing. You'll see it in the wood the mastery test, the third version of it has a lot more stuff in it than it used to. It used to be in the old day, they're just really looking at reading, reading of words, of non-words, comprehension, and things like that. Now they've got phonological processing things in there too, because we know now that that's really important to evaluate when we're evaluating someone with regard to reading. And the goal of oral reading, that's a great oral reading test, the GORD for short, is used because all the other tests are kind of asking you to do all this stuff silently and give us an answer. 
be kind of nice to know if they're actually reading the words properly. And so the goal for a reading test, they're reading it out loud, and we get to hear what they're actually reading. Is they reading the word properly? What are the mistakes? What is their fluency? Do they understand what they're reading? Those types of things. So these three in general are what school psychologists will often use. Uh, a test that I also like to see that some school psychs use and some don't is the uh, comprehensive test of phonological processing, the CTOP, which is its second version now of CTOP 2. I really like that one, which we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes. So the Wexler and Talking Scale for Children, you can see the various subtests that they're examining here. These are what this looks like the national testing. These, the ones I say you, they're, they're in this edition of it, but they weren't there in previous editions. So, yeah, listening comprehension, which is really, really important to evaluate because children who have dyslexia, they can learn stuff. And so listening comprehension is asking them, okay, we're telling you this stuff, what do you remember from it? You may have to read stuff and say, what do you remember from it? Because they're not reading well, they're not going to tell us much. So it looks like they don't understand anything. But listening comprehension, like, oh, they got it. They have really good listening comprehension. Then you can see phonological awareness is new, or on this version of it, rapid automatic naming is new, and then the oral reading fluency on the end, those are new. Uh, so it's a more comprehensive evaluation that looks at more things than just overall reading. Includes more. And then the GORP really hasn't changed much. Uh, you're looking at reading rate, accuracy, Fluency is a measure they develop from that and comprehension what they're able to comprehend. What we use, I'm going to tell you what we use because I certainly want to encourage people to do more of a comprehensive evaluation of what's out going on here. We look at phonological processing, obviously. We're going to look at letter name and sound letter correspondences. You might say, why would you look at letter names? I thought, did you say earlier that uh, you don't need any letter names? That's right, I did say that. but. I also said that whatever information that I, we can find that's useful to us, we will use. And here's the issue. In, in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, some of you guys were even more then, uh, we're looking at issues and strategies of how to identify kids as early as possible who had reading problems. And at that point in time, we really weren't evaluating kids as having a reading problem to the end of third grade. That's four years too late. <laughs> We could have been doing something. You know, it's that wait to fail model. We'll do, well, developmentally, we're just not there, we just need to wait. So we wait a little bit, we're like, well, they're still not really, let's wait some more. We can wait forever, we're not going to get any better. Maggie Brooke Fordekes told us that individuals who struggle with learning how to read in the very beginning of first and second grade are going to be adults who are, uh, who are illiterate. And that's a problem because we have somewhere between 40 and 60 million adults who cannot read well enough to read the prescription box. So now it becomes a health problem in addition to a reading problem. And we have a lot of people who just don't read. I mean, you see that stuff on your Facebook pages. You know, you write this stuff down, and you're like, seriously? Come on. Could you go to Google? Just Google. One minute at a time on Google, you'll find out what you're passing on is complete, utter nonsense. But we do it anyway. We need to read. We need to do more reading. Reading is important. We learn stuff when we read. Uh, so the letter name stuff, like I said, is not important to the reading process. But because parents have taught their kids the ABC song, and they taught the letter names, and they get to school, those kids who struggle to tell you letter names probably have phonological memory issues, which is also a constellation of dyslexia. And so even though it's not important for the reading process, it can be a good predictor, uh, which is, it sounds strange, right? But, you know, that's kind of the case. It's, it's correlated, it's not a cause, in other words. It's a, and it's something that's helpful to us to look at. So when we look at reading, spelling, and comprehension, we're going to look at attention. Because I told you that in my opinion, I don't think we have a comprehensive enough evaluation of dyslexia unless we're looking at both. Because they can sometimes look like each other. And we can have an individual who has, who's been treated, they, they have problems with reading, they have problems with phonological processing, they have all those difficulties, so we say they have dyslexia. 
And then we find out later on that they actually have ADHD and they get some type of treatment for ADHD and doing better with that. And all of a sudden now they're better readers. I'm like, oh, the four module process, they couldn't do the four module process because their attentional capacity. So we really look at, need to look at these things comprehensively. And when we don't, we're missing something that's probably pretty important. I mean, you wouldn't want to go to a doctor that said, like, well, you know, here are my pains, or here's what's going on. And they say, hey, take this purple pill, come back. And you come back, so it's not worried. Well, take two more purple pills. And you're like, is the purple pill the same thing you get every month? Well, yeah. But you got to drill down and figure out the problem is. You know, I mean, medicine is amazing. Uh, yeah, but it's amazing because we do the evaluation piece first, and then we remediate based on what we find. And that's obviously what we need to do here. They're going to look at psychological, emotional functioning, and we're going to look at auditory processing. It's, it's really auditory threshold. I shouldn't say the word auditory processing. It's a, it, it's a different beast than auditory threshold. But we want to know if they can hear within the range of speech. Because what we know about dyslexia is it's a special case of a language disability. And so children who have dyslexia are more likely to have articulation in their They're more likely to say the little way that ran along the walk. Or if there's a five part, part story, they're more likely, instead of telling you A, B, C, D, E, they'll might tell you C, then E, then D, then A, then B, and you're like, whoa, what was a parent like? That sounds really interesting, but start from the beginning. What's the first thing that happened? And the kid tells you, know, you have to cue them in. And so these are broader language issues, and dyslexia is a, kind of a specialized case within that. And again, my early research from like the 1980s to the uh, early 1990s, before I started getting interested in identification procedures, we were interested in why individuals who were good readers had problems with reading and why poor readers or good readers didn't. And one of the things we found was that individuals who were poor readers actually perceived speech differently. They didn't hear speech in the same way. So as part of our intervention is we work on their uh, ability to process speech information, which we know is different. So there's a lot of moving, complicated pieces here. And so there's a lot of things that we're, we're looking at. We'll ask the parent what they think the particular difficulty is, just for information, family history, because we know that there's a genetic linkage. And so it's relatively frequent that if you have a child who has a reading problem, you can ask the parent, does anyone else have problems, struggles for school, have problems reading? And they'll tell you, well, yeah, his grandmother never did learn how to read. Or actually, I have a problem with reading. So that genetic linkage you know, is kind of helpful. And again, a lot of times they don't think about that. Because one of the things we're finding is there are individuals who are getting diagnoses of dyslexia when they're 40, 45 years old, and you're like, how in the world can that be? How could they know just by out of 25 or 50 that they have dyslexia? And the answer to that is they struggle through school. They have difficulties learning to read. They struggle through school. They just didn't think they're a very good student. And they managed to get through school. And they're doing other things. Now they have children. And with their children, they're like, this is not happening to you. I am not going to allow within my power for you to have to go through school the way I did. Mm -hmm. And so they get an evaluation, and when they're hearing the results of the evaluation, they're saying, well, okay, your child's got a weakness here, and like, yeah, I have a weakness there too. Like, well, they have a weakness here, and like, I have a weakness there too, and the weakness here, and blah, 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 and then they're like, well, they have dyslexia. They're like, oh my gosh, that's what I have. I have dyslexia. And so they don't find out until later because they're trying to help their kids so that their children don't have the same experiences in school that they had, which they didn't really like. And so we see this actually pretty common. Because the average person really doesn't know much about dyslexia. I mean, if you think you don't know enough, parents know even less than you do. And so you can help them. You know, even have a parent support group at your school, you know, just so you can talk about it. Because parents who come to our center, even if they have children with extremely hardcore cases of dyslexia, I tell them, your kids are going to be okay. Your kids are going to be okay. And I can tell them that because I said, I know they're going to be okay because you're here, you love your kids, you're supporting them, you're trying to figure things out. These are things you aren't doing, here are the things you are doing. At the same time, then I, uh, we're also going to help them become a constant reader because that's, that's our goal. That's, that's why they're there. And then we want to know about development and what behaviors they see at home and what behaviors they're, uh, that they're seeing at school. 
And these are important things. Um, you know, and as an example, you know, we ask them what's going on during pregnancy and all types of things for any problems. And I always kind of find it interesting when a person says they smoke a pack of cigarettes every day of their pregnancy <coughs> and they have issues in their offspring. It's like, really? No kidding. <laughs> um, and I think I'm going to say something that's going to be shocking to you, but you can look it up to see that it's accurate. But individuals who smoke, the insult to the fetus is worse than if they were using cocaine. And you're like, that can't be true. It is. Because cocaine is a half-life, so the fetus has some type of recovery. But smoking, they never, it's always there constantly. And, and the outcome for kids with uh, smoking overall is much worse, uh, which is really unfortunate. Not only childhood cancer, but all, almost every ill that we know that humans can have uh, in terms of illness is made worse by or caused by smoking. So smoking is the one thing, if you stop right now, you can improve your life forever. Well, until you're not here. <laughs> And you're going to live longer. Uh, so we use, when we look at photological processing, when you see something in red, that's what we use. And I'll describe what we use in more detail. But we use a dyslexia, we call it a dyslexia evaluation tool. And I really like the comprehensive test of photological processing. It's a really good test. It is developed by three researchers out of Florida State University. And by the way, if you go to the Florida State University Center of Green, they have there lots and lots of good stuff they're giving away free. I would use that uh, if you had the opportunity to get there. Uh, but Wagner, Torgerson, and Rochelle came up with a company that has the form of the crossing. <clears throat> After decades of their own research, and it's uh, a really good test. Uh, the work I bring mastery test, which we learned and talked about. We're looking at measures of letters, reading, spelling, and comprehension. <clears throat> the work I bring mastery test, and of course, you know, our tool that we developed itself. And again, this is the audiometric threshold. <coughs> so we have an audiometer that we evaluate individuals on their ability to hear within the range of speech. Because <coughs> humans can hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And right now, most of us in this room right now, and even those young teachers, you probably can't hear 17,000 hertz. It, it diminishes pretty quickly. And high schoolers can hear 17,000 hertz. Uh, they have what's called a mosquito tone on their cell phone. They can hear it going off, but we can't. Like, oh, how do you know your phone is free? <laughs> we can't hear it. Uh, where I'm at right now, I'm, I'm about down to 14,000 hertz. You know, so over time, you lose the ability to hear the high frequency, which is no big deal until you get to the range of speech. When you get in the range of speech, then you don't hear what other people are saying. And that's usually between 250 and 8,000 hertz they need hearing aids or something like that, but if kids aren't hearing properly, then that, you know, since they already have issues with not processing speech in the same way, then it's going to be more challenging to develop that overlaying of the written form on top of speech, because the speech isn't there, right? So we need to know this is <coughs> Writing samples, I think, are extraordinarily important. And I kind of view writing samples as the window to the individual's reading and writing soul. Because we, we see individuals in our center whose portological processing skills aren't too bad, their reading skills aren't too bad, but their writing is horrible. We're like, how in the world does this look okay and this is looking that horrible? And some people would argue, well, there's a thing called dysgraphia. You can be a poor writer and not be a poor reader, but we haven't really seen too much of that. Most of the time what we see is individuals who are poor writers actually have weaknesses in phonological processing and other skills that aren't supporting that relationship between print and sound, so they're not able to read and spell very well. Uh, so that, that is uh, certainly an issue, but what we find in the cases where the kids are doing halfway decent in these other things is they've gone to some type of intervention program where it's actually lifting these skills up so they don't look too bad there but they're still not doing well enough on these skills to support the reading and writing. And so writing, I think, is really quite fascinating to look at in terms of finding out what's going on with a person's understanding between print and sound. Because you're asking them to produce the print. And if they don't have it, then something's going on. <coughs> so we dictate to them six short sentences, because it's not a memory test, it's a writing test. 
And we put words on there that are on purpose to, to get us an idea of what's happening. So if we see a child that spells like L-I-K, okay, that's great. I mean, that's phonetically correct. They're getting an understanding between print and sound. They don't know alternative spellings yet. They don't understand that there's a vowel consonant E thing going on there. Or if they spell read R-E-D or R-E-E-D or R-E-D-E, yeah, great. They're getting that development, but they're just not there yet in terms of alternative spellings, which is still a weakness that identifies particular issues for us. And you can see how that's the case on all of them. Uh, my favorite, though, my two favorite words are library, because we talk about how phonology and phonological processing is important to learning how to read. No doubt about that. But also, learning how to read is important in terms of helping us to develop our phonology. Because a lot of kids, they don't know there's an R after the B, so they say library, right? But when they learn how to read, there's, there's an R after B? Oh, it's library. That's why my mom or my dad is always saying, no, it's library. You know? Oh, it's library. <laughs> So that's a really good word because kids with dyslexia, they're not going to spell that word correctly. And younger kids who aren't aren't going to spell that word, that word correctly. Obviously, we have to identify these issues based on what grade they're in, too, and exposure to the relationship between print and sound. Uh, then my other favorite, my favorite word out there is circus. Because the way they spell circus is circus. I mean, crazy. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, if they spell it S-R-K-E-S, -E circus. That's circus, right? I mean, again, it's how they're getting that relationship. Uh, obviously, they're not spelled correctly because they don't know, you know, the R control power issues and some things like that. And then we ask them to write a short story about anything they want to. With kids with dyslexia, how long is that story? <coughs> Very short, you uh, Sometimes three or four words long. <laughs> but those who want to, what's interesting, I think, about this is you think, you know, as an adult, we think, okay, what they're going to do is think of a story, and they're going to think of the words they want to use, they know how to spell, so they can spell them really correctly in the story. <clears throat> they want to tell the story, they don't care if they spell the words correctly. They, they want to tell the story in the words they want to use. I think that's really good. Because we can help them with the rest of it, but again, we, to be a writer, you have to be a storyteller. So tell us the story. And those things are important. Because as a professor, I remember early on, there's this movement, you know, don't grade spelling or punctuation. I'm like, oh, that's horrible. You can't do that. We're going to lose our ability to write properly. But they're correct. You've got to tell the story first. It will work on those issues. I mean, if people don't know how to use verb tenses correctly, let's work on that. But we don't like to thwart them from and you still might be in that camp, because uh, that's kind of hard one, I think. Uh, more people will be able to spell these punctuation. <coughs> so here's the first kid. Uh, this individual on the side is our dyslexia evaluation tool, which looks at 14 different tasks that involve phonological processing, reading, words, and long words, et cetera. And you can see that performing in a very delayed range is a standardized test, uh, by, you know, uh, standardized on 2,000 kids, and so on. A standard score of less than 69 is very, very poor performance. Then you look at the writing again, you can see, you know, what you're missing. You know? And like, I can run fast, they like, can, okay, K. Okay. They write down K, and I don't know how to do the rest, they just skip it. School, library, and get, and ride, you know, I get to ride a bus, get, and rid. And then my, oftentimes, my spell and ride. Family is an interesting word, too, because they don't understand it. family, so it's family. So family and L-I, family. Uh, so you can see how these work in the black, B-L-A-K, white, W-I-T. So this kid is getting some understanding of the relationship between print and sound. So we got something to work with here. At least we know what to do. <coughs> and this is the, right, the story they told. I went to Colorado on Monday, and I came back on Friday. I like that story. Um, and there were words, there were words when we did this I didn't know, so I scanned and sent it to my daughter. She's a first grade teacher. First grade teachers are really awesome. They decide.
like you're going to ask them. Right? But the fourth one, I have no clue. Because I already told you that sometimes getting with dyslexia you will capitalize a letter right in the middle of a word. Like, is that C O capital U R A D? Is it C O what? I don't know what's going on with that. She couldn't figure it out either. Uh, so we called the kids. What was that story? Oh, Colorado. Okay. So I told my graduate assistants, okay, when you do this, when they're done, ask them, ask them what, they, what they wrote. Because some of them, it's really, really challenging to understand what they wrote. So that's part of the protocol now. Is we ask them what they wrote, and then we write it down so it like this. Here's another kid. The same score is less than 72. Still per, uh, performing poorly. And there's a 10 year old, and so this is a person who's avoiding reading and writing, so you can see their handwriting is not so hot. Because if you don't practice writing, your handwriting is not going to look so good. They might be able to draw everything else perfectly fine. It's not an issue of manual dexterity, it's an issue of making letters. And so you can see, I like, you know, L I K E is crammed in there together, read is, you know, kind of messed up there. And you can see how that's working out. There's some issues. This is the story they told. I'm going over to my friend's house to my friend and I'm going to ride bikes. You see there's some issues there. But even write R-I-E-D rather than R-I-D-E. So they're going to put letters in the wrong position as well. This is an eight-year-old. This is an individual that also had pretty significant issues and really didn't really write very much. And you can see they have a hard time even putting the, the letters on the lines, right? And then the story they told was, I've had a cat. This is the worst one. <clears throat> Very delayed. But this is an interesting story uh, with this individual, because this individual struggled to learn how to read, and the mom was homeschooling the kid. And when you first look at this, you're like, well, that's a big failure. But it wasn't. The mom was very bright. The son was very bright. The kid knew all kinds of stuff. But she didn't know how to teach the kid a reading problem. And the school the kid was in didn't know how to do it either. So she homeschooled the kid. And worked on everything else but you know, reading and writing. And as a third grader, she came to her and said, well, I really don't know what to do. It's really time this kid learns how to read. And so we did the writing step. And you can see very delayed, stand score less than uh, 69, very poor performance overall on phonological processing, reading, writing, spelling, all those things. But the decoding was so poor that, you know, the first sentence is, I like to read, and um, I can run fast. So I got that down. And then I like, ooh, ooh, oh, L, and I'm too exhausted to do the rest of it. And you, and you think, how can you be too exhausted? But I think of it this way. Cognitively, it's sort of like weightlifting, you know, in a sense. Like you've gotten to the point where you've done all you can because you've looked at a lot of weight, you just can't do another rep, right? You're like, mm, can't do it. You're working so hard to figure out this better sound stuff that's like, I, I'm done with that. And then I can, the attempt at I can was I can run fast, I got that, can, and I can't do anymore. That's it. He said, I can't, I can't do anymore at all. No short story, no less. Because the dyslexia was so severe that it was too physically exhausting to do any more than what he did. So in reality, I mean, this looks like someone, man, this, we should take that kid out of the home if they're not going to homeschool <laughs> properly. But they kid not everything else, all the content stuff, the kid was doing great. But the dyslexia was so severe, no one really knew what to do with them. Measures of attention. Um, this is, a, I think this is important because I'm going to tell you how you absolutely should not evaluate ADHD. And that is to suspect that your child has ADHD and then take your child to a physician who only gets 10 minutes of time with you. You do a checklist and go, okay, let's try 15 milligrams of Ritalin and come back in two weeks and find out your kids do it. Well, 100% of the time you're come back and say, what? The kid's doing a lot better. Because Ritalin is a neural stimulant that helps everyone. Like if you took, you know, for adults, you know, this low dose of Ritalin would be 20 milligrams of Ritalin for you. If you took it this morning, you would be interested in hearing my voice. That's it. And you take another shot at noon time, bam, you're ready for the rest of the day. Because that works for everyone. 
there's this misperceived notion that if we name a child who does not have ADHD, ADHD medication, turns them into ADHD. No, it doesn't. It helps them with their neurological process. I mean, we don't need it, so we shouldn't be using it, but it's still going to work. In fact, I had a friend who just retired a little while ago, and when he would go to a conference, he had a friend who was a physician that gave him a prescription for exactly 20 milligrams of Ritalin, and he'd take it in the morning of the conference and at the noon of the conference because he wanted to pay attention the whole time. Is that appropriate? No. Does it work? Yeah. <laughs> so we're not going to find out if the kid has ADHD by taking the child to a physician and doing a checklist and then using a medication. That's, that's not really the appropriate way to do it. In fact, to identify ADHD, we really need to look at several things. And these are the things we need to look at. We want to get information from the parent about what's going on at home. Although parents, particularly the first ones, aren't really sure what's appropriate and not appropriate behavior. Like if you have a kid and you go and see them in their home and they're sitting on the stand there, running around the table, pulling the cat's tail, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, you're like, you think this is normal? And parents are like, it's not. I didn't know. <laughs> I was the last board in my family. I never saw any kid behavior. Uh, but that's where we get information from teachers. Because you guys, and I know you guys don't necessarily define yourself this way, but it certainly is true, you are developmental experts for the grade of the, the age of the students that are in your classes. So when you've been taught and teaching for a couple of years, and you see a kid behaving that's out here compared to the rest of the kids, you know that's going to be an issue, right? So when we get information from you, it's a little bit more helpful than when we get from parents. Although certainly from parents can be very helpful, uh, it just occasionally, since these are both subjective measures, your feelings about these, you know, these individuals' uh, behaviors, uh, they may be a little bit off. So getting parents and one or two teachers really helps in that regard in terms of the behaviors we're seeing in those environments. We're also going to look at a continuous performance test, which is an objective measure of attention. And they're computerized based tests. And the person has to sit for a lengthy period of time doing these tests. And the results from their performance really give us a pretty good indication of what's happening uh, with that. So earlier, when you said about discrepancy, uh, I wanted to talk about discrepancy a bit. Because it's important, and I know there are still school systems across the United States that still use the discrepancy model, and we need to stop. Also, uh, school psychologists are trained in a method called uh, patterns of strengths and weaknesses. It also is a variation of the discrepancy model, one that we should not be using for kids who have uh, dyslexia and reading problems. And for those of you school psychs out there, going, what are you talking about? Um, we only are interested in the reading skills. Because if you look at the theory behind patterns of strengths and weaknesses, the authors of, who started that particular approach say average intelligence is the demarcation point. And so if we have low IQ, then see those strengths and weaknesses get changed a bit. And as a function of that, we're probably going to not identify kids as having a reading problem, and in fact, they have a reading problem. But here's initially, this is what the early to mid 1990s. Uh, there's a few of us researchers in the United States who were looking at this, and in Canada, who were looking at these issues. And what we did, is we're looking at kids who are poor readers. So we put them in two different groups. One group of poor readers we call the reading disabled kids. We put them in a group, and they were the group that had poor reading skills and average to above average intelligence levels. So they were essentially discrepancy guys, right? The other group we called the intelligent commensurate group, which means that their IQ and their reading levels were both low. So we put them in two different groups based on that. And here are the results. Time one is the beginning of first grade. Time two is the end of, second, or end of first grade. Time three is the beginning of second grade. Time four is the end of second grade. And you can see the, the yellow diamonds at the top. Those are the good readers. And they get to be good readers pretty quickly, and they stay up there. And that actually is going a little bit above where they need to be. You know, uh, standard score of 100 is you know, where, they, where we want them to be. And you can see both these two groups are performing pretty poorly, aren't they? And this is in word recognition, which means they're reading words. And 
although you see some separation there, statistically and science-based, there's no real difference between them. There's no statistically significant difference. So you can see they're performing statistically identically and significantly different than the poor readers. I mean the good readers, sorry, they are the poor readers. This group is a reading of non-words, which is important. And you can see the good readers are able to read a lot of non-words. And the, uh, the reading disabled and intelligent commensurate readers are reading about the same again. So the question becomes, if the reading skills are both poor, why are we using intelligence to discriminate between two groups that, in terms of reading, are pretty much identical? Well, some would argue it's important to do so because those individuals who have higher intelligence are going to benefit from remediation more so than the kids with lower So we did that study too, and we found out that actually the reading disabled group and the intelligent commensurate group equally benefited from intervention. So what that tells us is we don't need to be looking at intelligence at all in terms of identifying kids with reading difficulties. Now, if you're a school psychologist and use intelligence tests, that's fine to do that. But don't uh, not include an individual as having dyslexia or reading difficulty because they have lower IQ. Because there's really, like I said earlier, only a very weak to non-existent correlation between intelligence and reading. So essentially what we're doing is when we identify kids who have average to above average intelligence and allow them to have special education or 504 plan or some other type of remediation, and then we don't for the kids who have lower IQ, essentially what we're telling those kids with the lower IQ is you're too stupid to learn how to read. And that's not true. And so we need to stop using the discrepancy model. Which in reality, the discrepancy model bore the response to intervention model, right? That's the model we're using today. And if you read the literature on the response to intervention models, there's been some uh, discussion that the response to intervention model is a fail, it's not working, it's failing. And I can tell you that's not true. The response to intervention model works perfectly fine. The problem is, if you don't do the last initial correctly, it's not going to look like it's working. And what's the last initial? Intervention. So if you're using inappropriate intervention for a reading problem, it's not the model that's the problem, it's the intervention that's the problem. And actually, our lack of understanding of what an appropriate intervention is. So response to intervention is always what we should have been using. That's before we even had response to intervention, that's what teachers did. We found out where they were when we were to take them from step A to step B, right? That's response to intervention. I don't care what else you call it, but it's absolutely response to intervention. So we've always been doing those types of things. And so the issue with response intervention is we have to have a science-based appropriate intervention for dyslexia to see improvement in reading. If we're not using those types of interventions, then it should be absolutely no surprise and predictable as that we're not going to see an improvement. So psychological and emotional functioning, when we look, there are many measures out there, but we use the behavior assessment system for children. And that's where we get information about anxiety levels, depression, suicide, ideation, and those types of things. The dyslexia evaluation tool is one that we developed from the early 1990s. Because again, my early research was trying to identify individuals as early as possible. And using these methods at the beginning of first grade at the time we weren't identifying kids until the end of third grade, we were 98.6% accurate. And so, we continue to use these particular sets of variables, and now other people are as well. So we look at letter knowledge, letter sound knowledge, word knowledge. Word building is the reading of not words, because some kids are memorizing the visual constellation of the word. And if they're doing that because they have reading problems and they can't use the mechanics of reading, again, the mechanics of reading is knowing the sounds that go to the letters, how to decode those letters into sounds, how to synthesize to read the words. If you can't do the mechanics of reading, and you get to a word you've never seen before, you're stuck, right? And so the reading of non-words is really important. It helps to identify those individuals. Then we do a deletion task. And we actually start with the deletion task. We do compound word tasks where they delete words from a compound word, like mailbox, without mail would be. Right. We do those because 
most kids can do those pretty easily, so they feel like they're doing something successful. And then we do syllable deletion, where they delete syllables from words, which then we have more individuals who are having challenges with that. Then we do onset line. The onset is the first consonant or consonant cluster, the line, R-I-M-E, is the vowel and everything that follows it. And then we do phoneme deletion. And for us, although theoretically there should be differences in performance based on onset rhyme versus phoneme deletion, we've never seen it. It's almost like to do onset rhyme properly, you have to understand phonemes anyway. I just mentioned that because if you guys do onset rhyme stuff, it's like, I don't understand why they're not performing better. It's probably don't know much about the phoneme stuff either. Then we have onset rhyme and phoneme blending, which is synthesizing. Then we do segmentation where they tell us all the sounds in a word. And dynamic segmentation is the same task, but there are half as many trials on it. Instead of 16, there are eight. And you've heard of um, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, probably. And what we're trying to do is figure out what support do they need to get the, to do the ability. And so some kids who are failing at the segmentation task, we gave them a little bit of support they would get it pretty quickly. In other cases, they really don't get it. And it's, important for us to know why they can't get it, because segmentation is extremely important in terms of reading. And so what we do is there's eight items instead of 16, and then we give them uh, seven different probes. The first one is just barely a probe, and if they don't get that, then we go to probe two, probe three. We get lots of kids who get eight, eight items by seven probes. A lot of kids get actually 56, which is the poorest score they can get on this task, who have reading problems. And some of them don't. And this ha doesn't happen very often, but it shows you how the, you know, looking at support uh, can help individuals acquire a particular task. But two weeks ago, we had an individual we evaluated and did very poorly in segmentation. When we did dynamic segmentation, they, they failed the first two items, and then the third item, instead of going to uh, probes of seven, they went to probes of five. The next one was probe four, and then they got the, the next four correct, which is kind of interesting, right? It's like, oh, they, they must not have been too far off to get that. Uh, so that's why we look at those things. And then sentence completion. For us, sentence completion is a measure of comprehension, and it's a close C-L-O-Z-E test, where there's a missing word from the sentence, and the person wants to tell us what the missing word is. And I always tell people that it's a proxy for comprehension, but when we did our validity study, we found that this task correlated 0.85 with measures that measured compre comprehension. And those of you who know much about statistics, 0.85 is like super King Kong in terms of correlation between you know, variables like that. I mean, one is really great, 0.9 is even better, 0.85, I, was, I just have to say I was super happy to see that. It's so like, oh, it's not really a proxy, it's actually measuring comprehension, which is pretty cool. And the last one look at spelling. You can see how many items are on the test, and it takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour to do this particular part of the test. Uh, I mention this to you because you know, we're interested in identifying kids and we want to share as much information with you as we possibly can. So ADHD, we talked about this. Talk about all the different things we're looking at. Um, when we're done with our evaluation, we get the parents to take them to a physician. So instead of the physician working with you for 10 minutes to figure out if they have ADHD or not, they got all the stuff they can look at and go, okay, we'll evaluate the person medically and then we're going to do something. So it's more information for them. So I wanted to show you what the COVID test looks like, because that's the test that we use. So the target, whenever they see the target, they're supposed to push a button if they hold them in a little thumb across. So when they see the target, they push the button as quickly, but accurately as possible. When the non-target comes up, they're not supposed to push the button. They're not pushing. So this is what the test looks like. And it will only show for like 22 seconds. But. So do it, you know. That's target, non-target. So you know, you're responding. Whoops, see, you, you, you hit the, yeah. so you can see how that goes, right? So that's like 22 seconds. This pass goes on for 22 minutes. Right. Um, 
And so an individual who has potential capacity issues, we're going to find out. There's no doubt about that. I'll take it off with you guys are going to drive me crazy. <laughs> We'll have occasionally a child that, you know, they don't like doing this test. And so like, I have to go to the bathroom. Can you stop us from the bathroom? Like, we can stop the test and you go to the bathroom. We have to start from the very beginning. Like, no. <laughs> they don't like the test. But interestingly, the first half of the test, the target, the, the target comes up one time for every 3.5 times the non-target comes up. So they're not pressing the button much. So a kid who has ADHD primarily didn't have a presentation. They're in a dark room, the only thing they can see is that, and they're staring at the little fixation point, and it flashes up, like you just saw. And so they're looking at the task, and they're doing the task, right? And they're not looking away if there's nothing else to look at. They're looking at the task, they're doing the task. But a kid who has ADHD, what happens is sometimes they look at it and they're kind of disengaging from it, and they're like, oh yeah, there it was. So their response time can be large, you know, it can be longer or it can be shorter. So that variability in response time is what really indicates that they have an issue or not. For a kid who does not have the ten potential issues, they're doing the task and they're doing it pretty accurate the whole time through, even though they also hate it. You don't have to hate it just because you have ADHD. You don't like it because it's just a horribly boring task. The second half of the test is the reverse. 3.5 times the target comes up for every one time, not where it comes up. So they're pressing the button a lot. So a kid who has impulsivity issues is looking at it, and they do the test right. So when the non target comes up, they're like, oh. And so what they do is they, again, that variability increases. And so it's a very good objective measure of attention. And one that we can use to understand if the individual who is getting medication of some sort, if it's actually working, we're going to do the COVID test again and see if it's helping them out or not. Uh, because if a parent decides to use medication, one of the frustrating things about it is they try different medications it's not working. It takes a while to find the right one. And then the right one, what's the dosage they need to use? It's just a real pain. And a lot of parents are like, I'm, I'm done with medication. Well, if kids need the medication, if that's the strategy that's going to help them, then essentially we're telling them we're not going to do anything to help you out. And that's not really helpful. And I'm not necessarily a person who, uh, you know, is going to push medication because I'm not. But at some point, if a child is struggling in school and not benefiting, it's also affecting their interpersonal relationships with other people. Uh, at some point, it's like, well, we need to do something. And, and obviously, you would not give a person you wouldn't withhold medication for a person who has you know, diabetes, like, well, we don't believe in medication. But that's, it's the same thing. It's neurochemistry, but it's still the same kind of issue. Of course, ADHD is not going to kill you, or diabetes can, but, you know, but you kind of get the point. So before I do this, let's take 10 minutes, because still a lot of information, and buzzing around, so I can take 10, and we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs>